Welcome back dear friends. We continue our reflection on the parable of the prodigal son. So now the young man has decided to go back to his father. Let us see what happens. The image of the father seeing his son in a distance and then running out to welcome him is one of the most moving images present in the Bible. Let us look at this text closely. Now how will the father see his son from a distance if he were not looking out for him daily? Scripture experts tell us that the father must have been going to his terrace daily to seek out his son. And mind you, the son did not come back after a week or a month. He was gone for many years. So imagine every day for years on end the father would go to his terrace and look out for his son. So much love the father had for him. So much love the Father has for each one of us, if only we could see. Jesus then proceeds to tell us something about the Father. The Father was moved with pity. If you recall at the start of the parable, when the younger son demanded his share of the inheritance, the Father simply gave it to him. Now that the younger son has come back after using up all the father had given him, what is the reaction of the father? Jesus tells us that the father was moved with pity. Dear friends, I want you to picture this most heartwarming scene in your minds. The father did not fly into a fit of rage or anger. Rather, the father was moved with pity. The father is all love. This brings us to mind the book of Exodus, when the Lord gives Moses an experience of who he is and God pronounces himself as the Lord, the Lord, a God of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in kindness and faithfulness. Jesus says something that would have shocked his Jewish audience. The father ran to the boy, hugged him and kissed him tenderly. For an elderly man to run on the road was something unthinkable against the norms and customs of Jewish culture. Also, according to the Jewish culture, if a prodigal son returned home, there was a ceremony done where the person was pronounced as cut off from his people and the village would have nothing to do with that person. But not the father. He did not care about the rules of society at that moment. He rather ran to the boy, clasped him in his arms and kissed him tenderly. Jesus wishes to highlight this important fact. God is not bound by our customs, rules and norms. His love is unconditional, everlasting. A crazy love which we humans will never understand completely. We recall here the words of Pope Benedict XVI. God never tires of coming to meet us. He is always the first to set out on the path that separates us from Him. Dear friends, so immense is the love that God has for us. At this point, I would like to focus on what Pope St. John Paul II says about the Father's nature. The merciful Father who embraces the prodigal son is the definitive icon of God revealed by Christ. First and foremost, he is Father. It is God the Father who extends his arms in blessing and forgiveness, always waiting, never forcing any of his children. His hands support, clasp, give strength, and at the same time comfort, console, and caress. They are the hands of both a father and a mother. Let us pause for a while to take in all that we have just seen in this brilliant parable and how it would apply to our Lenten preparation. The fascination of illusory freedom, the abandonment of the father's house, the extreme misery in which the son finds himself after squandering his fortune, his deep humiliation at finding himself obliged to feed swine, and still worse, at wanting to feed on the husks the pigs ate. His reflection on all he has lost, 
his repentance and decision to declare himself guilty before his father, the journey back, the father's generous welcome, the father's joy. All these are characteristic of the process of conversion. Yes, dear friends, I invite you to look into ourselves and see the prodigal son in us. We, all of us without exception, are in need of conversion, a change of mind and heart. Lent is the best time to cry out to God to touch us, to renew us. Recall in verses 18 and 19, the son had carefully rehearsed what he said. And so when he met his father, he attempted to do just that. But what was the father's response? The father does not cease to amaze us. He's so caught up in his loving his young son that he is not listening to him. He stops him short to tell all those around and us as well of his loving plan for his son. Before I proceed further, I want to highlight something about the sacrament of reconciliation here. When we go to confession, do bear in mind that God is not interested in our sins. All he wants is to see a sincere and repentant heart, and he will simply lavish his love upon us. Such a beautiful and loving God we have. As St. John reminds us in his first epistle, think of the love that the Father has lavished on us by letting us be called God's children, and that is what we are. Let's look once again at verses 22 to 24. And as we read the text, dear friends, please visualize the scene. It is one of the most dramatic and heart-moving scenes ever presented in the Bible. The father lavishing his love on the prodigal son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the calf we have been fattening and kill it. We are going to have a feast, a celebration. Because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches us, the beautiful robe, the ring and the festive banquet are symbols of that new life, pure, worthy and joyful of anyone who returns to God and to the bosom of his family, which is the church. The robe, the ring, the sandals and the celebration also indicate that the father was restoring the sonship of the prodigal son. The father was announcing to the world, even though his son behaved most shamefully, that he has forgiven him and restored him back to his place as his son. Nothing less would do for the father. Yes, dear friends, when God forgives, he forgives completely. It is as if the slate was wiped clean and we start all over again with him. Through the sacrament of confession, our sonship, our daughtership in the father is restored. We become, as St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 17, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. As we come to the end of the Father's response, I wish to reflect on this magnificent statement from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Only the heart of Christ, who knows the depths of his Father's love, could reveal to us the abyss of his mercy in so simple and beautiful way. How beautiful the forgiveness and mercy of God the Father. There is one person who has been in the background all this while, but now appears on the scene. Let us find out who he is. The elder son, who was not mentioned except in the first verse of the parable, now comes on the scene. Recall the parable starts by stating that the father had two sons. Jesus tells us that he was out in the fields. It may seem that this elder son was a hard-working person, better than the younger son. At least he never left his father. But in these initial verses itself, the tragic character of the elder son emerges. Jesus mentions that the elder son was out in the fields. Far from commending the elder son as hard-working, 
Jesus is drawing the attention of his hearers to the fact that the elder son was not close to the father, even though he lived in his house and was working for him. Jesus is now speaking of those who seem to be doing everything right as per the Jewish law, but whose hearts are far from loving God. Yes, he is directing his attention now to the Pharisees and the scribes who detested the fact that Jesus was mixing with tax collectors and sinners. Could we find ourselves now in the person of the elder son? We may be doing great work in the church, but in fact we may be doing so only to win vain glory for ourselves and please our egos. Jesus is warning such an audience of his. We need to pick up the traits of the elder son and see which aspect of our lives resemble the elder son. It is interesting to note, even though the elder son hears music and dancing, he chooses to call one of the servants. He could have easily gone up to his father and asked him. This goes to show how far he was from his very own father. As if to rub salt on the already wounded ego of the elder son, the servant reminds him of who the main characters of the story are. They are your brother and your father. It takes an outsider to remind the son of who his family truly is. It's like somebody from the roadside admonishing your daughter or son on the correct behavior to adopt when talking to you, the parent. How unfortunate was the state of the elder son. Now the complete character of the elder son emerges. He is one full of anger because he lived a life feeding his ego. He lived a life which was all about himself with little or no concern for his father or anyone else. He uses words like slave for you, never once disobeyed your orders. He does not refer to the younger son as, as his brother, but rather as this son of yours. All this was indicative of the fact that he saw his role more as a servant than a son. What a tragedy. He too was a son of the father, but never really lived like one. And this is yet another consequence of sin. It causes us to live like slaves when we are in fact called to live as sons and daughters of the father. As St. Peter reminds us in his first epistle, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart to sing the praises of God who called you out of darkness into his own wonderful light. Alas, we choose the glamour and luxuries of this world, which are merely passing and only lead to emptiness and pain. It is only fitting that this parable closes with the Father, for the centre of this great parable is the merciful Father. The Father does three very important things. Firstly, he reminds the elder son of his relationship with the Father. Secondly, he reminds the elder son of his relationship with his fellow brother. Thirdly, he reminds the elder son of what is at stake here. Let us see these carefully. I encourage you at this point to just close your eyes and picture the father saying these words to you. My daughter, my son, you are with me always. All I have is yours. Can you believe this? As far as the father is concerned, we are with him always. We may leave the father externally like the younger son or internally like the elder son. But the Father is always with us. What a God we serve. The Father says further, all I have is yours. What does the Father have that is ours? It is this, eternal life with the Father, Son and Spirit. A life of deep communion with the most holy triune God. The Father reminds the elder son, as did the servant early on in the parable, on who the younger son was. He is your brother. An important aspect to realize is that all those around us are at the end of the day our brothers and sisters. We may not be able to relate to them because of whatever complexities and issues there may be. But one thing is certain, we need to pray for others. That's the least we can do. Leave the rest to God to restore in his way and in his time. 
Finally, the father reminds the elder son and all of us what is at stake here. God does not want even one of his children to be lost. Everyone is precious in his eyes. To be in sin is to be dead. As St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Life is found only in God. Thus, to come back to God is to move from death to life. This is crucial for God. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost but may have eternal life, as Jesus reminds us in the Gospel according to John. This, dear friends, is at the heart of our faith. Jesus died and rose again so that you and I may have a chance to come back to life, a life in the Father, Son and Spirit. Our Lenten preparations, whatever they may be, must lead us to life in the triune God. Dear friends, I would like to close with this beautiful painting of the prodigal son by the famous artist Rembrandt. Look at the prodigal son. His feet are soiled, his robes are torn, he has no hair left, he looks totally worn out. This is what sin does to you and to me. It disfigures us. The focus on the painting is on the father embracing the son. There is a theme of light and darkness used by the artist. Notice how the prodigal son just immerses himself into the bosom of the father and see how tenderly the father embraces his son. The father is shown as an old man, not because God is old. No, God is eternally young. The father is shown as an elderly man to highlight that it is after a very long time, years on end as we saw earlier, that the younger son has come back. Lose yourselves in this loving embrace of the father and his prodigal son. If you look at the other characters, you will see the elder son, shown as standing upright and stern. The light is unfortunately not very bright on him. This draws home the important lesson that if we continue to be full of pride with no love in our hearts, even though we may be doing great things in the church, we are actually living in darkness. As St. John says in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 9, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the dark. If you notice, there is no closure in the parable of the prodigal son. We don't know whether the elder son finally listened to the father and accepted his brother. We also don't know if the younger son ran away again. The parable is incomplete. This is because this parable reaches its completion in your life and mine. What is our response? Friends, if we find ourselves afraid to approach God and ask for his forgiveness, let us bear in mind these encouraging words of Pope Francis. How many times in my pastoral ministry have I heard it said, Father, I have many sins. And I have always pleaded, don't be afraid. Go to him. He is waiting for you. He will take care of everything. We hear many offers from the world around us. But let us take up God's off instead. He is a caress of love. For God, we are not numbers. We are important. Indeed, we are the most important thing to him. Even if we are sinners, we are what is closest to his heart. Dear friends, let us ask Mother Mary to journey with us during the season of Lent, that we may enter the Paschal Treedom with the right disposition and thereby enter the Easter season transformed, renewed, so as to receive fully the new life that Jesus wants to offer us in the Spirit. Pope Francis reminds us, may the Virgin Mary, refuge of sinners, kindle in our hearts the confidence that was lit in the heart of the prodigal son. I will arise and go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Thank you all for being part of this reflection. I encourage you to read the parable of the prodigal son through the season of Lent. And let us ask the Holy Spirit to give us the grace to contemplate the heart of the Father, a heart full of mercy and love, 
so that we may truly experience the compassionate love of God the Father. I close with these beautiful words of Pope St. John Paul II. We are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. God bless. Ave Maria.